Welcome home. This is Audio EXP for the 17th of April 2021. And the title of this episode is How Long Do Your RPG Sessions Last? This podcast is being recorded on the 50th birthday of traditional tabletop role playing. The first ever session of Dave Arneson's Blackmore game was held on April the 17th in 1971. It started at 1 pm and it ran till midnight. Let's tackle that opening question first then. How long do your tabletop gaming sessions last? Do they also run from 1 pm to midnight? Thanks to a Paul of Paul that the blog Seed of World pulled together, we've got a good idea of the average. Now, as usual, there's an entire post on Geek Native that goes into this in more detail, but I'll tell you the average. Most gamers, well, those who took part in the polls anyway, get weekly sessions that last for about five hours. Very few gamers get longer sessions, but over time, more gamers are getting more regular sessions. I thought it might be fun, perhaps even helpful, to open that up as a Geek Native poll. So I've done that. You'll find it embedded in the transcript to this podcast, and you'll find a link to that in the show notes. I'll also share it on Discord. I can also imagine a time when more people are spending more time living in games. That's the future of books like Ready Player One, see, after all. In that near sci-fi vision, virtual reality is so good, cheap and ubiquitous that most of humanity spends a good chunk of their day plugged in. Going to school is done as their VAI avatar, so is dating and so forth. Announced this week, the Chinese-American company Epic has raised $1 billion to build the metaverse. What does that look like? Well, we're not at Ready Player One technology yet. First, Epic is going to add social features to their current games, and then they're going to connect those together and extend those connections to third-party games. The Unreal Engine will develop along these lines. Next, Epic wants to let you take characters from one game to another. I imagine that this concept of this is me is precisely what they're aiming for. The digital self, your cloud avatar, your online persona, and whether it's virtual reality or not, Epic wants to be the company that coordinates it all. Raising $1 billion means that big companies with big budgets believe in Epic's vision and their ability to deliver on it. One name stands out from the list of companies that provided the cash. That's Sony. Sony provided 200 million of that one billion. Sony, of course, makes the PlayStation. And let's stick with that theme and talk about one more multiverse. That's a new company with a new platform, currently in closed beta, but which will soon open up to the rest of us. One More Multiverse is a virtual tabletop style solution designed to make your tabletop RPGs easier to play. The company insists, by the way, it is about tabletop RPGs. However, looking at the demos, you might think they're playing a JRPG, a 2.5D style game. Sprites move around a world map, health bars go up and down and combat characters jump back and forth to land hits against spawned monsters. The demo even shows a Twitch audience sending in votes to help determine an outcome. If successful, I think one more multiverse will really challenge us as to what tabletop role-playing is. It's become the thing to add TT or a T in front of RPG to make it clear that you're not talking about a computer role-playing game. I get it. However, isn't the table the most minor thing in traditional role-playing games? It's not the furniture that makes RPGs great. It's the complete freeform and the social interaction around them that brings storytelling, adventure and characters to life. It's about choice. Also, this week, By Night Studios started taking pre-orders on the Mind's Eye Theatre Vampire Volume 2. Mind's Eye Theatre is the World of Darkness live-action roleplay, and this is a genre of RPGs that technology has not yet touched. 
you dress up as your character. You go out to a location. And I used to do this in pubs here in Edinburgh and act out your vampire. You talk to people. And in fantasy LARPs, you might even have a foam dagger in which to plunge into their hearts if they talk back. I'm glad Mind Eye Theatre is still going, but I'm frustrated that I missed by Night Studios did a whole crowdfunding exercise around Vampire Volume 2. Sadly, it's as impossible for publishers to tell every hobby blogger about their plans as it is for bloggers like me on Geek Native to know about all the projects and find the time to write them up. But I'm here now telling you about the book while it's on pre-order. It has rules for playing as Vampire Elders. I haven't found time for LARPing since well before the lockdown, but it may be something I consider after it. What I can promise I'll do after the lockdown is support my local gaming store. There's one within walking distance, but I've never been. In my defence, it's hidden. It doesn't have a shop front. I think it's in the basement, downstairs, and sometimes I need a stick to move. So you can see my caution about trying to find a hidden basement game store. But Scotland is coming out of the lockdown, and I am determined to find the store. The chance to win a thousand pounds in cash from my pocket is another reason to make the effort, right? Here in the UK, that's what Asmodee is offering. Okay, that's for all stores that they deal with in the UK, and England will open for retail before Scotland. But that doesn't mean my chances are zero. If you're in the UK, the same is true for you. If your local game store gets stock from Asmodee, and they probably do, then that first prize could be yours, or one of the other follow-up prizes. Sticking with the theme of lockdown and prizes, it's worth noting that there will be a virtual Crunchyroll Expo this year, in August. You can register now for free, and to do so before the end of April means getting some free downloads. No competitions, these prizes are guaranteed. Additionally, you also book your place into any future prize packs not yet announced. It's uh, very late in the lockdown for me to be discovering ideas for clever things to do while in the lockdown, but I have. And that's reskinning board games. Or, as not to sacrifice your games, cutting out fresh bits of card and downloading graphics to print off and glue on. The idea of board game skinning comes to me via Pokéson, which is a fantastic Pokémon version of Carcassonne. The blog has links for Pokemon-style pixel map tiles and rules for the retheme. There are even photographs showing what the swapped-out standard meeples look like as Pokemon meeples. Uh, Spoiler, they look great. And while we're on the subject of looking great, the first issue of Lock and Key Sandman is out. The series is called Hell and Gone, and Joe Hell is a writer on it. That's right. The keys open up the gates to hell, and Sad Man is involved. It makes perfect sense to me, and the trailers for it look great. There's even a free-to-download Hell and Gone Zero, and that's 46 pages of great story and art to persuade you to invest in the rest of the series. Previews, I find, are much better than trailers as predictors of quality. That warning to take trailers with a pinch of salt is on my mind this week. I'm sorry to report that I did not enjoy The Way of the House Husband as much as I had hoped. The anime is about an ex-accuser who gives up his life of crime to work hard on being a great house husband. The trailer was filled with some great gags. Sadly, that's it. There are five episodes on Netflix and each one has the same joke told about five different times. It's more of a motion comic than an anime, although that visual style works for me. I may be in the minority though. The anime I didn't like was Netflix's top anime in Japan this week. Season 2 is confirmed and on the way. No doubt Netflix are happy with the figures. Earning more of the anime market in Japan has to be a win for them. And if they didn't like the quality of what they got when they commissioned The Way of the House Husband, they never would have aired it. You might remember that Wizards of the Coast had, or claimed they had, issues with quality of commissions for their Dungeons and Dragons in Japan. Those claims and their attempt to end their translation license with Gale Force 9 resulted in lawyers and then an out-of-court settlement. 
Wizards of the Coast will stick with Gale Force 9 for now until the contract ends. Asmodee were another translation partner, but in Italy, the company has announced that they are no longer providing that service to Wizards of the Coast. While Asmodee will still distribute D&D in Italy, Wizards of the Coast are taking direct control of the translations. And this story, somewhat surprisingly, was popular on Geek Native this week with readers from outside Europe. I can only imagine that people are generally curious about any news that might point to the future and plans for D&D that Wizards of the Coast might have. Another popular story this week also relates to quality, curiosity and companies in control of franchises. And that story is about Lumen getting an SRD. With one exception, Lumen is a little known indie, as most indie RPGs tend to be, and it's optimised for playing fast and high octane games. The SRD, the Systems Reference Document, means that third party designers can now use Lumen as an engine for their own games. I did say there was an exception. Lumen was going to be used for an RPG inspired by the computer game Warframe. The designer, the creator of Lumen, Spencer Campbell, even had a Kickstarter going for it. However, some Warframe fans took umbrage. Despite Lumen only being inspired by Warframe, despite not reusing any Warframe assets, these fans launched a campaign of harassment or perhaps uncoordinated angry message and Campbell had to cancel. I'm pleased to see that his experience has not sent Spencer Campbell fleeing from the scene. It's such a shame that some geeks get so aggressively possessive of their fandoms. A much larger company that's been launching SRDs and working with people to adapt projects to them is the French publisher Studio Agate. They're the talent behind projects like the the Fate Forge 5e setting. Right now, they're running a French crowdfunding campaign for Vermin 2047. That's a post-apocalyptic RPG when the dominant force on the planet becomes, just as the name suggests, the vermin. Sound interesting? I noticed in a tucked away comment on Instagram that they are actively working on an English language translation. Oh, I fear Kickstarter is going to get even more of my money at this rate. And since I seem to be spending much of this podcast grumbling about my finances, let's inject some good news. Pazio has done us proud and made available for free Pathfinder Fists of the Ruby Phoenix Player's Guide. It's a junky but spoiler free document that you can give to your players or they can grab themselves ahead of Pazio's big focus for 2021. It's a good idea as it means players can read about the setting and the players can know what their characters might know. Hopefully for Pazio, this player's guide is more of a curation project than a creation project and therefore relatively cheap for them to produce. I'm sure freebies also help recruit people to Pathfinder. Roll20's latest data shows that Pathfinder is the fourth most popular system on their virtual tabletop. Pathfinder 2nd edition is the fifth. Call of Cthulhu is in third, Homebrew second and yes, D&D 5e first. No surprises there. What is surprising is the growth of systems. Which RPG system do you think has seen the most significant growth? Apocalypse World? Nope. That's in second place and, in percentage terms, miles behind. Year Zero Engine? Nope. That's in fourth place behind Cyberpunk. Age? Wrong again. That's eighth behind the Pokemon system and 3DT and Alpha, which I'll have to do some research on. The star of Roll20's growth chart is Luke Crane's Burning Wheel system. That's the same Luke Crane who, by mutual agreement, left Kickstarter after an outcry over his The Perfect RPG Kickstarter campaign. I guess this could be an example of how there's no such thing as bad publicity. The Burning Wheel is a great system. I worry that the timing sucks though. I don't like the idea that because Crane generally hurt some people that others decided to reward him with their time. I don't know him, but I doubt he'd want that either. The Burning Wheel certainly doesn't need to be any gammon's sympathy system of choice. If you are looking for a new system, I have a curveball idea. Firstly, I think my current favourite is still the Cypher system from Monty Cook, but I was thinking about the game Machinery's Defiant again this week. 
As it happens, they have big news with plans for a hardback and an above and beyond way to make that fair for people who might have bought a digital version believing that the hardback would never be available. They will also do a quick start and they've outlined a potential roadmap that takes the adult supernatural game through a series of expansions and supplements. I also want to recommend some bundles. They seem to connect up my moaning about cash, search for good deals and are a clever way to try something new. In the bundle of holding, there are some downloadable blueprint style battle maps from Zero One. They include a design for 221B Baker Street, a Nautilus and some cities. In a separate deal, there's also a host of Mike Resnick sci-fi ebooks. In fact, I think there's over $200 in retail value if you can make the threshold price. In Humble Bundle, there's a chance to get your Warhammer 40k reading ahead of the series of releases that Warhammer Entertainment is probably planning. There's also a D&D comic book bundle from IDW. Lastly, tonight on the Discord server, we'll be hosting a round table to discuss inhospitable settings. Audience tickets are free, and you're welcome to join us. Expect write-ups afterwards. And on that note, let's wrap there. So please keep safe. Don't forget the session duration, Paul. And we'll see you next week.